Good afternoon, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues. My name is Danny Kwa. I am Acting Dean and Lee ka Professor in Economics here at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. It's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to this evening's public event on India at 70. In particular, it is my great pleasure to welcome to the Lee Kuan Yew School and back to Singapore, Mr. Rahul Gandhi, President of the Indian National Congress Party. Thank you. Mr. Rahul has kindly agreed to take part in this conversation on the topic India at 70, and he wants to do that with all of us, including everyone in the audience when it comes time for the Q&A session. Now, to maximize the time in our conversation and for Q&A, Mr. Rahul has eschewed the usual opening lecture. Joining Mr. Rahul Gandhi and myself on stage for the evening's discussion is Ms. Pallavi Rachel George, one of our Lee Kuan Yew School Masters of Public Policy candidates. I also want to mention Mr. Milin Deora, former minister in the government of India, co-founder, along with the Honorable Mr. Vivian Balakrishnan, of the India-Singapore Parliamentary Forum. Mr. Milin is not here on stage with us, but he is in the audience. He had kindly helped arrange this evening's conversation. Now, I want to go right into this conversation in a discussion where we're going to focus on Mr. Rahul's take on global competition, India's foreign policy in a fast-changing geopolitical environment, and India's possible arc going forwards amidst all the internal and external developments that we are witnessing. I want to be sure we leave plenty of time for Q&A with you, the audience. When we get to that portion of the program, again, let me remind everyone, if you could make your questions short and succinct, so we can get in as many questions and responses from Mr. Raul as possible. I would also like to, when we come to that, make sure that you come up to the microphones that are on the corridors so that you know, we can hear you properly. Um, this event has to end promptly at 6.25. So at that point, I will remind us again when we get to that, at that point, I will ask everyone to please remain seated. Mr. Rahul Gandhi and, and friends need to get to a different engagement promptly. So if, if at the end of the event, I could get you to remain seated while we exit. Uh, that would be greatly appreciated. Let's begin the conversation. Pallavi, can I invite you to reflect a little bit in conversation with Mr. Rahul on India's general achievements and its general trajectory? Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, through my first question, I would like to take us back to the four pillars that Mahatma Gandhi wanted India's independence to rest on, namely nonviolence, cultural and religious pluralism, creation of self-sustaining village economies, and social justice. How has India fared on these parameters since independence? Have we met Mahatma Gandhi's expectations for our country? Well, to meet, to meet Mahatma Gandhi's expectations, I think, uh, um, he was a very hard taskmaster, so that's that's difficult. Um, I mean, you can always do better. I think often people take Gandhiji literally. You know, um, a lot of times people say that um, he speaks about village economy. Right? But actually, what Gandhiji was saying, the idea of Swaraj is decentralizing power to the last India. And building an in India, India where everybody feels that they have a space, everybody feels comfortable, and a harmonious India. So we've done a pretty decent job uh, of doing that. First big step was one man, one vote. The idea. Uh, Constitution and the idea that each person should have a vote. Uh, Green Revolution, 
self-sufficiency in food, computer revolution, we've got Sam Petroda sitting here, telecoms revolution, uh, 1991 liberalization of the economy. So we've been pretty successful. Um, we are one of the fastest growing economies and all this, we're not a small country. Mm. We are we're one of the biggest countries. So I'd say, I'd say it's been a decent show. Um, could always be done better. Thank you. So out of the 70 years of India's sovereignty, the Indian National Congress... Can I, can I just... Yes, sorry, of I, course. Where we are running into trouble now, mm -hmm. right, is the levels of violence, the levels of anger that you're seeing in India. Right. And this, to me, this is a... This is central. Mm. The, in, the idea of India that Gandhiji envisioned was an India where everybody felt they had a home, everybody felt comfortable, regardless of religion, regardless of community, regardless of state. Mm. The idea that anybody coming into India, uh, even a foreigner coming into India, felt comfortable in the country. Mm. And that is an idea that is now, uh, I'm sorry to say it, but that is an idea that is now being challenged. So my next question is, out of the 70 years of India's sovereignty, the Indian National Congress has, been, has formed the government for 49 years. What, according to you, are some of the key achievements that India has achieved since independence and the key areas we've fallen short in? Maybe it's economic or social, etc. I mean, whenever you're talking about India, hmm. uh, you're, you're talking about over a billion people. So we've completely transformed over a billion people economically. Mm. Our GDP, uh, when we started, versus our GDP now, you, you can't even compare it. Um, electricity to the villages, mm. education. Mm. I mean, one of the big achievements that we had in the last 10 years when we were in power, uh, we took school, school enrollment to 90%. Mm. I mean, it's, it's not spoken of, but it's a revolution. Uh, so we have the IITs. Right. We have, I mean, a lot of you sitting here hmm. are probably products of those of those institutions. So mm -hmm. uh, there are uh, there are tremendous successes. I'd say when we started, and if you read the literature, uh, pretty much everybody said we're going to fail. Yeah. So in the mm -hmm. in the late 40s, 50s, uh, India was world development community said India's taken the democratic route. Hmm. It's impossible. You can't bring so many people together. And we fundamentally believe that you could actually do it. And we disproved mm -hmm. uh, the idea that you can't actually take, develop a billion people using democratic institutions. So that to me is something that makes me very proud. Hmm. Always, as I said in the beginning, you can always do things better. So I don't say that, look, you know, we we successfully did everything mm -hmm. and the game is up. I think it's a, um, it's a process that's ongoing. Uh, there's a lot that we can do on education. Mm -hmm. There's a lot that we can do in healthcare. Mm -hmm. Today, the way I'd like to frame it, there are, there are two massive migrations taking place mm -hmm. on the planet. One is taking place in India and the other one is taking place in China. Huge numbers, millions of people moving from villages to cities in both the countries. We've chosen two completely different ways to manage that migration. The Chinese have, have chosen an organized way of doing it, and we've chosen a sort of decentralized way of doing it. And there are advantages to their system, there are advantages to our system. But one mustn't underestimate the energy and the power that is released when you take over a billion people from rural economy to an urban, urban economy. Mm -hmm. There are massive expectations. There is tremendous fear. Yeah. Uh, people don't realize it, but moving from a village to an urban environment where you don't know what is going to happen, where you don't know whether you'll get a job, is actually a terrifying experience. Mm -hmm. So that produces a lot of angst. It produces a lot of Irritation, it produces a lot of anger, and management of that process mm. is something that we've been reasonably successful so far. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Yeah. 
Um, one of the key parts of any democracy is its institutions, and I would like to draw your attention to the judiciary. Um, it's one of the most trusted institutions, but at the same time, there are a lot of calls for um, reforming it. And very recently, the people of India witnessed an unprecedented move by the senior most judges of the Supreme Court to hold a press conference and to tell the public that there are discrepancies in the way how the court functions. What are your thoughts on this, and how do you think we can address the larger um, requirement of judicial reform? The Normally, hmm. what, what I've seen um, in India is people go hmm. to the judiciary for justice. Yeah. And for the first time in my life, I saw four Supreme Court judges actually go to the people for justice. Mm -hmm. right? So they actually went to the press and said, listen, we need the people to hear our voice because there's something fundamentally wrong. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know the details about, um, I mean, the details about the comments they were making, but mm -hmm. at the center of that issue uh, is the case of Mr. Amit Shah, mm -hmm. right? So there is, a, there is a challenge to the institutional structure of our country. Mm -hmm. there, is a, there is a particular type of politics which is not only happening in India, it's happening in a number of places of dividing people, of using anger mm -hmm. to win elections. And that's, that's happening in India. You, when you're moving so many people, there is, a, there is an expectation, there are aspirations, there is also fear. You can use the expectations and the aspirations positively you can tell someone, listen, you know what, we're going to make it successful, we're going to make you successful, we're going to get you a job, or you can tell them, mm. you know, you should hate that person. Mm. There are two completely different visions, and I'm quite proud to say that our vision is of bringing people together. And it served India. It is actually, in my mind, what makes India strong. I, I think, for me, if you ask me what am I proud of about my country, since not only Mahatma Gandhi, but since thousands of years, mm -hmm. it is the idea of our plurality. It is the idea that people in India felt that they can say anything they want, they can do anything they want, uh, and they won't face repercussions. That is being challenged. And it's, it's not apparent outside how aggressively it's being challenged. Mm -hmm. We see it in India. Um, you don't hear much about it, but it is a very, very aggressive mm -hmm. and organized uh, attack on the system. Mm -hmm. And it's the judiciary. Uh, if you speak to the press, it's the press. Mm -hmm. uh, if you speak to business people, there's, there's business people who will tell you that we feel intimidated. <coughs> so there is a general atmosphere of intimidation. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, so my next question is, um, today is International Women's Day, and so I felt it would be appropriate to ask you regarding the women's reservation. Am I allowed bill? to ask you counter questions? Or? <laughs> <laughs> like, is that just, you, just you so we can go again? You can, you can. And um, so for the benefit of the audience, this particular bill seeks to give 33% reservation for um, women in the parliament. And currently, women occupy only 12% of uh, India's parliament, which is far less than the global average of 22%. Why is there a delay, sir, in um, passing this bill, especially when it appears been, that all been, political parties are We've been pushing it, no, all political parties are <laughs> down for it. We've been pushing it. We've, uh, the, the foundation, the foundation of women's sort of empowerment in politics, women entering politics, the foundation was the Panchayati Raj uh, mm -hmm. Act, uh, village government. And that's where the first women's reservation were passed. So there's, at the lower levels of the political system, there's tremendous participation of women. Mm. That it's not all good because some of it is, you know, somebody's wife and somebody's uh, relative, but by and large, it's been very successful. Mm. And, and you're getting a generation of women at the panchayat and at the ward level where they're saying, okay, now we can play a game here. Mm. Um, we tried to pass this bill in the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha a number of times. Hmm. Um, but it was opposed uh, 
it was opposed by a number of parties. Okay. Uh, we've been telling the government of India that, listen, we need this bill passed and we will fully support it because mm -hmm. we believe in women's empowerment and women's participation, but uh, not getting much of a response. But I've told, I've told at least the women in, in the Congress party that we are going to push very aggressively to make this happen in the parliament. And we are, we are doing that. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, think, I think not having women play a role in politics um, is a tragedy. So I think, I think it's critical. Thank you. Thank you. In Kerala, you have quite a few women playing. Uh, we do. <laughs> you're not, you, don't, you don't have that problem. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Rao. Oh, yeah. Now we're, we're delving now quite a bit into specific policies, your vision for policies. And I would like, if I may, may, to draw you out on your specific vision for policy on jobs and on growth in the Indian economy. Uh, and this gets at something you mentioned earlier, that the, the terrifying process of hundreds of millions of people moving from rural to urban areas typically. We know that that's part of the, the growth and development story because on average around the world, when someone moves from a rural area to an urban area, their productivity increases by 50 to 100%. So that's very, it's a very important part of the growth process. But of course, the other part of this growth process is that we've got to have enough jobs for these hundreds of millions of people who are making their move. And I'd like to draw you out on that vision for how job creation, economic growth, urban transfer transformation is going to proceed. But to put some structure on the conversation, perhaps if I may, I would like to, to quote back to you okay. some of the things that you had written. Um, I'm in, in trouble now, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> in a, what have I written? <laughs> In a, in a recent article in the, in the FT, you wrote, with connectivity, but no threat from Chinese productivity, there would still be blue collar jobs in the West and India. This of course is a reflection, not just on India, but on America and elsewhere. It's a very important, cogent observation. And then you go on, with Chinese productivity, but no connectivity, Economies would suffer, but institutions would still function unchallenged. It is the combination of the two factors, the connectivity, the so the technology, and the, the threat from global competition that is such a danger to many other economies. So, so to, to extract from that, you're talking about robotics, AI, fourth industrial revolution on the one hand, that connects up different societies, and you're talking about competition from China. Yes, but it's really principles about competition generally, international competition generally. There has been, to put it bluntly, devastating for India on its blue collar jobs front. That's the assertion that you make. And it's one that I think many, many people would stand by. But what I'd like to draw you out on is where you personally see policy can come in on this. Where do you see yourself potentially making policy on Indian job creation? Is it gonna be in large scale manufacturing? Is it, as you've suggested elsewhere, connecting small and medium sized Indian businesses with technology? What is your, your vision for how we look forwards and we see job creation and growth transforming the Indian economy in the light of technological advances and global competition? Tell us how you're going to transform. So in, in the 20th century, you had the idea of the big factory. Mm. And it, it started off in Europe, went to the United States. Um, China then built a similar structure. As I said in that article, the difference, of course, was that the old factories were concrete blocks. The new factories in China are factories with nervous systems. So they're actually connected, it's connected architecture and mm -hmm. infrastructure. Uh, putting a 50,000, 60,000, 100,000 man factory um, in a democratic environment has its own challenges. People can ask questions, people can say, you know, raise issues. So China has successfully done that. I don't think India can go down the route of 100,000 man factories. Mm. But there's, what I see is a tremendous opportunity coming for India. Mm. And that's 
with the sort of fourth generation manufacturing. Mm -hmm. You know, you said, you, you said, what is the thing that you did well? And I answered you. And then you also said, what is the thing that you haven't done so well? Mm -hmm. So I'll pick that up right now. If you look, let's not look prior to the 90s, mm. because things were different prior to the 90s. But if you look from the 90s to today, mm. and there's decent amount of Congress governments in there, mm. and there's 10 years, 9 years of BJP governments. You can see in India tremendous increase in growth. Mm. But when you look at the job numbers, they're not there. Absolutely. Okay? And that's a fact. So our record in the UPA was better mm. than the BJP's record. Uh, but our record wasn't exceptional. Mm. Their record is actually particularly bad. In fact, you have the highest levels of unemployment in India are today. Mm. In, in eight years. Mm. How I see the problem is there is a disconnect between our skill system mm. and finances mm. and technology. So if you go into, if you go into Indian districts, I, I travel quite a lot so I've had that experience, you go to a Muradabad, there is a infrastructure of skills in brass making. Mm. You go to Mirzapur, there is an infrastructure of skills for carpet weaving. Mm. You go to Tamil Nadu, you can find Sivakasi has a particular skill base. Mm. Problem is policy is not connecting that skill base mm. to technology, to money. And to me, that's an extremely powerful thing to do. If we can take our skills, mm. which are basically old traditional networks, and connect them to finance and to technology, mm. you will get a complete transform transformation of Indian manufacturing. Mm. It won't look like China. It won't look like 50,000 man factories. But it will be entrepreneur led. It will be small and medium business led. Mm. But it will be transformational. And you will feel the impact of something like that uh, across the world. It's an exciting vision. And like you say, it's actually a transformative vision for how across the world we think about patterns of growth and development. Because everywhere else in the world, the idea is that it is manufacturing, large-scale manufacturing, learning by doing, that gets people on the skills ladder that moves them up. But the vision that you've described for us is one where even in the face of technology, which might have suggested or threatened jobless growth, you have a vision that says that we can circumvent those obstacles. I am, I am actually viewing technology, technology sort of 3D printing, extremely disruptive mm. to the 50,000 man factory. Mm. It's not disruptive to small and medium. Mm. So I'm actually seeing a huge opportunity for India if we can connect our skill base to this technology. Mm. I'm, I'm absolutely certain it will be transformatory. And will it be information technology, digital technologies? Exactly. It'll be, we've already laid out, and again, sorry, but this is some work that the Congress Party did. Mm -hmm. We've already laid out a communication infrastructure. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. we've, we've linked all our villages to fiber opti optic cables. Mm -hmm. So that network is there. Mm -hmm. There are only a couple of pieces that need to be put together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is getting the skills, skilled guys, getting the finance, mm -hmm. and bringing the technology in. And mm -hmm. I'm 100% sure you will not recognize what happened in India. I want to I give you another example. What is the power of some of these networks? I just, I just want to give you an example. Today in India, when we think about training, mm -hmm. and we think of the concept of the ITI, mm -hmm. concept of the ITI is basically a training institute. That training institute is completely separated from the actual skill system. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so I'll, I'll say something crude, but let's say you want to tra tra uh, train barbers and hairdressers. Currently, what do you do? You take your ITI and you say, okay, we're going to get a person who's going to train barbers. Mm -hmm. The correct way to do it is there is a network of barbers across the country, millions of them. Go to the barbers and tell them, okay, listen, you start certifying barbers. You start training your barbers. 
for every barber you 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 train, we will give you a certain amount of money. All that barber has to do is be certified, mm. and you have an explosive system of training people. Mm. That, that's what I mean by connecting the network. So when you think about India, knowledge is trapped in networks, mm. and those networks are not talking to each other. Mm. You connect those networks, and you have completely transformational growth. That's why telecoms is important. Mm. And you can do this. You can do this in healthcare. You can do this in education. Mm. You can do this in skills training. Mm. You can do this across the board. So I'm, I don't buy the idea mm. that India can't challenge and compete with China mm. in manufacturing. I don't buy it. Right? But, but, but what I will say is India cannot compete with China in 50,000, 100,000, 200,000 man factories. Mm. I think some of these technologies will be pretty disruptive to the Chinese. Absolutely, yeah. Right? Mm. And I don't, I don't necessarily know how that would play out. Mm. But I'm very excited. Mm. And I'm excited because a lot of the people here are the types of people who will put this thing together. Excellent. Excellent. I mean, that's a, that's a very exciting vision you've laid out for us. And as I said, it's transformative in many ways. Can I press you a little bit? This logic is so compelling. Why hasn't it happened already? No, no, no. No, there's a reason. There's a reason. There's a reason. Uh, it has happened. It has happened. Yeah. So, for example, for example, if you look at, if you look at the successes, mm. if you look at a Maruti, mm. that's exactly what has happened. Right? So, so to say, I mean, it, I'm happy you clap, but to say, <laughs> to, oh, the, the Indian auto industry, mm. Maruti factory, mm. auto components industry, mm. that's a success story. And I can, I can give you success stories. Uh, the milk, mm. the milk uh, Amul story is a success story. Mm. The, the sugar cooperatives in Maharashtra, success story. Mm. Right? And I can name you 10 success stories. But where we, are, where we can really get aggressive mm -hmm. is now in the manufacturing space because the technology piece mm -hmm. is actually an enabler. I see. It, wasn't, it wasn't an enabler 20 years ago. Okay. It, 20 years ago, if you wanted to do manufacturing, the only way to do it actually okay. was in these big silos. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. I'd like to come back to these maybe at, at some point, but I also mm -hmm. want to make sure... We're sitting in Singapore. This is Singapore's year of ASEAN chairmanship. Right. And India plays a hugely important role in the way ASEAN views its economic story. Mm -hmm. And I know Pallavi has, has some questions for you on this. So perhaps I could hand over to you, Pallavi. Thank you, Prof. Um, as Prof mentioned, we've seen the kind of uh, strong relationship that ASEAN and India has been having very recently as well. Um, at the same time, there's also talk that a lot of it is just political relations which are very close and that actually there might not be as much with trade etc. So uh, what are the key areas that you can envisage for this relationship maybe in the next five or ten years? I mean I was with the people from Tamasek today mm -hmm. so there is a huge sort of uh, space where they are operating in the investment uh, area. Um, I think culturally Singapore I mean it's a very interesting place because um, in some ways, there's India, there's China, mm. and then there's Singapore. So you're, you're sort of, you're an interesting balance. And you have some of the, uh, some of the same problems we have. I mean, I, I remember talking to uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew and him, him sort of explaining to me his strategy of housing in Singapore and how you brought together all different communities you know, into your public housing system. So there's a lot, there's a lot that we share in terms of uh, culture, history. I just went to um, Subhash Chandra Bose Ji's memorial today. So, so there's a lot that can be done um, together. Mm -hmm. uh, I also feel that India has a, a, a role, I wouldn't say a responsibility, but I'd say certainly a role where we have to engage much more aggressively with the outside world. We tend to, we tend to get focused 
inside. We, we're mm. a pretty complex country and every now and then we'll start to look inside and start ignoring what's going on outside. So I think that is something that we should be aggressively doing. Okay. There's a lot of stuff we can do in education. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of stuff we can do in healthcare uh, with Singapore. There's a lot of stuff we can do in eye care with Singapore. Mm. Um, I think I think if you if you ask me where the real magic can happen in India, it's healthcare. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. And I think that I think you can't you can't enable some of the healthcare magic in India mm. without connectivity with countries like Singapore. Mm. Okay. So I, that those would be some of the things. So if I could just but prod you can give me suggestions on that as want. well. <laughs> um, so recently the government brought out the health insurance scheme which seeks to give probably the largest health insurance in the world. So what are your thoughts on that? Because if it gets implemented, it's a tremendous... Can I ask you a question now? Yes. <laughs> how much money did they put in that scheme? Uh, the fiscal deficit would go high, that much no, I but know. How much <laughs> money have seen in politics? Uh -huh. yeah. uh, if you say, listen, I'm going to give you this, hmm. In your budget, you got to say, this is how much I'm going to put to give you that. Mm. How much have they put? Anybody in the audience know? Zero, I know. <laughs> I know. Zero. Zero. There is, there is no money. Mm. Mm. So, I mean, if, that, if those are the rules we're playing by, mm. tell me which scheme you want. Right. <laughs> which one do you want? You want, you, want, uh, you want the aeroplane scheme? I give you the aeroplane scheme. You want the <laughs> rocket scheme? I give you the rocket scheme. So, when we are talking serious politics, uh, you got to put fuel behind these mm -hmm. things. When we say we are going to give um, the job scheme, Narega, mm -hmm. we say here's your Narega scheme and here's 40,000 crores. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. You can't say that we are going to give you a scheme and then when we say, guys, uh, how much money is there? Mm -hmm. Sorry, that's not, there's no money. So that's what I think about the scheme. Hmm. However, I do think healthcare is a tremendous opportunity. Hmm. Um, healthcare in the 21st century is basically data. Hmm. Okay, hmm. you're going to move from a world of doctors to a world of data. It's like the it's like a pilot. Hmm. Right? You had pilots earlier. Now you don't have pilots. They call themselves pilots, but they're basically system managers. Mm. The plane is flying itself. They're sitting there because people need to be comfortable that there's a pilot sitting there. Right? And the entire thing is managed through GPS, uh, through mm. other communication systems. Mm. That's where the world of the doctor is going. Right? So what are the important pieces? Mm. Diagnostics. Records of people past records of people, mm. DNA, these are the type of things. And on every single one of these, India has a scale that nobody can compare with, except the Chinese. Mm. <laughs> but I'll tell you, this is an interesting thing. Here is where democracy and freedom of ideas is actually on our side. So we can actually we can actually do things with that data that the Chinese can't do. Okay, mm. I, I want to come in on this mm -hmm. if I may, but I know that you'd also like. Can, to can I just say yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about this stuff. So <laughs> yeah, and I don't traditionally in India, right? Our idea has been healthcare for Indians. Mm. We've never seen the global healthcare opportunity. Mm as being something that can actually be part of the healthcare for Indians play. Right? I can envision a world where Indian healthcare data hmm. is helping treat people in Singapore. And you might not like this, but no, Singapore is paying India for it. I, I'm very fine with that. I'm so that's, <laughs> that, that, that's, I mean, I, you know what I think? I, I think, for example, uh, this is, this is where big countries come into their own, yeah. right? Yeah. To me, when I, look at, when I look at all these MRIs taking place in India, right? Mm. And I don't see those machines connected. 
I see a huge problem. Yeah. And I can, I can see that if we connect all those MRI machines, you will completely transform healthcare on the planet. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, again, this is a very exciting vision. And I wonder if I can just expand on it a little bit and then you know, try to extricate from you your views on, on international inclusiveness, India's place in the world, as it were. Because that's what we've started talking about now. Mm. And early in the conversation, you, you crafted for us this wonderful, inspiring narrative of Indian inclusiveness within the country. That there was, you know, the, that we had to get away from this narrative of anger and, and exclusion and that, was, that you worried about that might be emerging. And I wonder if I could use that to think about how India takes the world stage. You know, we started talking about ASEAN. We're talking about extracting, you know, extrapolating from it. And you've mentioned consistently China, competition with China. I want to now bring we, all of that together, if I may. And this might be a little bit, uh, it, it might make a little bit of an uncomfortable conversation, but let's have that. No, 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 no. Okay, no, sorry, sorry. okay let, let's do that. But can I just uh, yeah, make certainly. one point? Yeah, Go ahead, yeah. You said that, and this is, this is part of the nature of India. Mm. You said that India has to take the world stage. Yeah. We don't want to take the world stage. We just want to be part of the world stage. Okay. okay. So we, we don't view ourselves as people who are going to take something. Okay. We, we feel that we have a role, we have a place, yeah. and that's all we want. Yeah, so that's fine. That, that, that's, that's very consistent with how I want to, to phrase this. There are those who think that the world is in the midst of a global power shift, away from the West towards Asia. This is the, the Asian century. It's the new Asian hemisphere, as you know, the founding dean Kishore Mabubani referred to it. We, in Asia, we have two giants, two billion people giants that we have been talking about in terms of manufacturing and comparison. How Asia as a whole, including these two giants, responds to the, these large geopolitical changes will matter hugely for how the world system evolves. Now, in your writings, in your speeches at Berkeley and elsewhere, you very explicitly set India on one side and China on the other. Right. You talk about how India does not have, nor does it want, China's coercive instruments. We do not want our massive factories controlled by fear. We you know, do not want the process of development that China has embarked on, where Chinese people are not free to speak, to dissent, or to question. That those who do are swiftly and severely punished. Now, I think that if, when those observations are correct, all thinking people will agree with you. We do not want to tolerate that. But it does not seem to me a, a good place to begin a process of in, international collaboration. That we might want to be looking at the good things that we share across countries in Asia. So I want to hear how not India taking the world stage as like, you know, being the global hegemon, but how you see India in collaborative partnership with ASEAN, with China, on this, in the midst of this geopolitical turmoil. Do you think that, do you, you know, th th these phrases that I've read about China will sit uneasily with many Chinese people who don't actually recognize it of their society. Nonetheless, it is, does characterize segments of this. So I, I suppose what I want to hear from you is a narrative of India's international collaboration going forwards. How do you craft that? See, um, what the Chinese have achieved um, is impressive. And it is a manifestation of their culture and their way of doing things. And I'm no one to comment on how they choose to do something. So uh, they've been pretty successful at, at building a, a manufacturing structure. And by all accounts, they're doing pretty well. So I respect that. India has a completely different culture, a completely different society, completely different way of thinking. My point there was that 
We can't replicate that. We don't want to replicate that. Mm -hmm. Because we're different. Mm -hmm. Saying that, India has to have a peaceful, cooperative relationship with the Chinese. India has a strategic relationship with the United States. But India is a big enough country where we have to have a relationship with everybody, including ASEAN, including the Chinese, including the United States, including Europe. Okay. Uh, my point there was that one mustn't think of manufacturing in one particular way. I see. And to a lot of people feel that, OK, you know, manufacturing is 50,000 man factories, and let's do it. Mm. And my point there is that. Uh, that's not going to happen. India doesn't have the structures. India's society will not be able to absorb a 200 man, 200,000 man factory. Okay. Your earlier point about power shift. Mm -hmm. In an unconnected world, you can say Europe has power, America has power, Japan has power. In a connected world, that's problematic. For two reasons. One is everyone's connected. So in a way, your power is my power. It's not very easy to separate. right? Um, and second, because of asymmetry. So you can have people who are very small, but suddenly become very disruptive or very powerful. So I don't, I don't see the sort of linear idea that, OK, now we are shifting from here to there. I, I feel that you're going into a new paradigm. And the rules in the new paradigm have to be different. Cooperation in the new paradigm is important. Uh, a, a hot war mm -hmm. in this paradigm is probably suicidal for everybody. Mm -hmm. so, so you have to reorient yourself from the 20th century where uh, you were drawing these lines mm -hmm. and saying, OK, this is the West, and this is the East, and this is the North, and this is the South, and this is the poor, and this is the rich. Mm -hmm. And you got to, those lines will get blurred. And you got to think along this new paradigm. OK. OK. That's a very rich tapestry and something for us all to reflect on. And it's very optimistic how we, we think about the nuances going forward. If I may, I, I don't know, Pallavi, if you want to raise a further point on, on Kashmir, or should we open it up to the, the I audience? I think I would like to ask the you question. Like, yes. You like asking me difficult yes. questions. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been particularly critical of uh, the BJP government's policy or what you've called the non-existent policy on Kashmir. Um, so how would you address Kashmir in the short term and in the long term? I think one complaint, one complaint I have of the BJP foreign policy in general is that it's very tactical and it's episodic. It's not strategic. Uh, that's, that's a broad uh, point. 2004, um, we were handed a Jammu and Kashmir, which was on fire when we came into power. Hundreds of people dying, terrorism, violence. And Manmohan Singh Ji sat down with a couple of us. And we made a plan. And we worked on it for nine years. Okay. And the plan was, how do you build bridges between people? That was the plan. To me, this is one of the biggest achievements of our government. When we left government, the way we used to measure it, very simple. I used to go, others used to go. We used to measure the number of planes landing in Jammu Kashmir, mm. tourist planes. right? And we knew that if we were at five, that was really bad. If we, were, if we were one, it was terrible. If we were at five, that was bad. We got to 50. right? That means massive amount of tourism coming in mm. by the end of our government. What did we do? We held local body elections, Panchayati Raj elections, mm -hmm. where we got thousands of new elected representatives. 
we connected thousands and thousands of women from Jammu and Kashmir to banks through a self-help group uh, program. Mm. We took businesses to Jammu and Kashmir. I took them myself. Uh, we took youngsters from Jammu and Kashmir mm. and took them to Bombay, took them to uh, Karnataka, took them to Bangalore and showed them mm. what is going on. Mm. And I was surprised mm. at how powerful that thing was. Mm. 2012, mm. I was, uh, we had basically destroyed the terrorist movement in, Panj in, in uh, Kashmir, finished. Right? Mm. And, but let me tell you something. This was not fancy speeches. This was not big talk. Mm. This was all, and this was not me alone, this was not the Prime Minister alone. This was hundreds and hundreds of people working quietly, mm -hmm. behind the scenes. And in 2014, I went to Jammu and Kashmir, and I, almost, I, I felt like crying. Because I saw what a bad political decision can do to years and years and years of work. Mm. The BJP made an alliance between, the P, with, between them and the PDP, and it just blew the place up. Mm. And what it has done mm. is it has opened the door for forces that are against India. And it has created a serious strategic problem for my country. Now, this stuff doesn't run in the papers. Mm. This stuff is not what, you know, mm. this doesn't work in bites. Mm. But this is the truth. Mm. So for me, I've seen the power. I've sat in a room. I'll tell you a story. I've sat in a room. I've sat in a room with, a, with an MLA from Punjab. Mm. MLA is a member of assembly. Mm. Who sat down in the room and he's held his head like this. And I've said, what are you doing? He said, you know, I can't believe what is happening. Mm. I said, what? Mm. He said, you know, 20 years ago, I was basically a terrorist. And now, I'm sitting here making laws. You engage with people. You bring people in. You trust people. You believe in people. It works. I've seen it. With the harshest of people, I've seen it work. So, it's very easy to... Uh, Pretend that you'll have simple solutions. You won't have simple solutions. Mm. Right? But you, you start to build trust. You start to bring people together. I had, I had a fantastic conversation. You know, I, I almost cried when I went to Jammu Kashmir. And then six months later, mm. I was like, OK, there is hope. So I went, when I went in 2014, 2013, mm. I had the people from Jammu come. And they said, you guys have done nothing. Then I had the people from Kashmir come. And they said, you guys have done nothing. So I was like, OK, we've done nothing. And then election happened, lost the election. And then I was like, OK, now the thing is on fire. Mm -hmm. A year after the election, I went. Mm -hmm. People from Jammu came. And they said, nothing's happening. So I said, what do you mean? They said, nothing's happening. I said, why? They said, because they don't talk to us anymore. Mm. Mm. Then five minutes later, people from Kashmir came. They said, nothing's happening. I said, why? They don't talk to us anymore. I said, so then? He said, then they said, there's no way but to talk. Mm. There's no way but for us to talk. Because nothing happens if you don't. Mm. So you can divide people you know, and play this politics. How is dividing communities going to get you jobs? You explain that to me. If you can give me an explanation, I'll buy it. But if I divide this room, how are we going to build cooperation? How are we going to build a country? Okay. So to me, Kashmir, I mean, I like the, I like the question because it's, it's at the heart of the problem. You, you go in, you carry people, you, you show them affection, you show them love, they will respond. Every single time. You show them anger, you're nasty, they will respond every single time. 
so that that to me is that that is also the spirit of my country okay okay thank you thank you for that thank you so thank much you, thank you so much really lovely thank you kripya hamare channel ko